You know, overcoming denial has a crazy way of taking us back to where we had the denial. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, think about it every now and then when we, uh, we have something that uh, we fail or we struggle or we, we get caught in, oftentimes we have to go back through where we went in order to get that corrected. It's not a bad thing. Actually, it's kind of a therapeutic thing to go back and face the very things that once led us to our, our denial or our rebellion. But the truth of the matter is that's where we find the person of Peter in our passage today. Now, Peter, many of you may not know much about him, but he's a guy that's in this conversation through Mark as one of the disciples. He's been following Jesus throughout this conversation. Peter's kind of a, a fisherman of trade. That's what he was doing before Jesus said, come follow me. And while he was doing that, you know, you begin to get a picture of who he is. The, he was nicknamed one of the sons of thunder, you know, kind of a big braggadocious man is kind of how I envision him. Maybe his skin's a little uh, leathery and tanned from the sun. His hands are calloused and he's got the kind of grip that would crush any man's handshake. You got this guy who probably walks into a room and, you know, he's, as a fisherman, he's not the kind of pull a line kind fisherman. He throws these big nets in of rope and then pulls them out with their fish. And so he's probably somewhat strapping and strong. You see a guy that comes in that maybe, uh, maybe when he leaves, he kind of leaves an odor of fish. You know what I'm saying? So you find this guy who's a little bit big, rambunctious, strong, handed. You find a man who kind of captures a room just by very entering it. But he's also the kind of guy that kind of speaks too quick flies off the handle, responds inappropriately in certain times. I'm so glad none of us can identify with a person like that, right? You know what I'm saying? But you find yourself in that situation, and you think about Peter and where he's going, and where we're going to go in Peter's life today is we're going to see a moment where uh, Peter is greatly encouraged. He's affirmed in who he could be. Then we're going to see a moment of Peter where he completely blows it. Matter of fact, says he won't, and then he does. And then we see a moment where Jesus brings him back to a very familiar spot to begin to restore him and move him forward. Now, we've been in the Gospel of Mark, this conversation, this kind of apologetic of who Jesus is for quite some weeks now. We've been unpacking this Greek word, euthos, which is used 41 times throughout the book of Mark. And of those 41 times, 14 times the word euthos is used for the word immediately. And that conversation of immediately has been for us to be able to look at how people responded to Jesus, how Jesus responded to people, or how those consequences played out in people's lives immediately after some of those encounters. Now, Mark, we discussed, talks about Jesus as being the suffering servant. And the suffering servant is a phrase that is used from some of the Old Testament prophets to begin to describe and talk about this coming Messiah, who Jesus would be, that he would give his life as the payment for our sins and our sacrifice, that it would be the payment of new life and the forgiveness of sins that would come through this Messiah, our suffering servant. And Mark is trying to give us a portrait of that. And so we said there are two questions that we feel Mark is pressing into all of us to ask, and it's these questions. First and foremost, is Jesus worth following? And if so, will you? Now, we had a few passages we could look at today, but this is the, the final passage that actually has the word immediately in it. But in order to do that, we need to look at a passage before it, and we need to look at a passage after it. And our outside passages are going to be from other Gospels to kind of give us a perspective of some of the things that are playing out as we look at Peter's life through this conversation of following Jesus. So I want you to go ahead and first and foremost, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Now, as we've already kind of described with Peter, Peter is one of the apostles, one of the first followers of Jesus. Now, Peter is also known as being this somewhat fly-off-the-handle, foot-and-mouth syndrome kind of person. He's overzealous. He even, uh, while Jesus is in the garden, they go to arrest Jesus. He goes to Jesus' defense, and he literally cuts off a guy's ear. I don't know if he missed. I don't know what was going on, but he just grabs the knife and goes crazy. And almost every time you see Peter in the scriptures, you see a guy who's very well-intended, but he just misses the mark. You see a guy who's got a lot of zeal, but tends to overcompensate. You see somebody who really wants to do the right thing, but every time, or a lot of the time, just doesn't get there. And it's going to be encouraging to us 
It's going to be encouraging for us to walk through Peter's life because I think we, we begin to learn this truth today. And it's that despite our worst, Jesus still uses us to his best. Despite our worst, Jesus still uses us for his best. So we last read a, a little bit from Mark about this discussion about who Jesus is and uh, what's going to be coming. Who do you say that I am? And as they're going through this process, they're beginning to uh, lay out this identity of, of Jesus. Who is he from what culture and what the people around him think? And then what do the true followers of Jesus, what do they say of him and how he is perceived in this community? Matthew chapter 16 takes a moment to kind of reemphasize that. And I want to read it today to kind of give you an idea of where Peter's going in his life. Here's what it says. When Peter came, or excuse me, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, the others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus is asking. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh, but by blood, not re re revealed by flesh and blood, excuse me, but by the Father in heaven. And I tell you uh, that, I, sorry, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Jesus is kind of taking a poll. How do people see him? And who do you say that he is? And in the conversation, they begin to give these answers. Well, like the prophets of old, whether it's uh, Moses or Elijah, we, 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 we see variations. We see how, how, how you represent them quite a bit. And that's what people kind of think. But they're not quite sure if you're John the Baptist, one who's coming to talk about the coming kingdom, or if you're entering in the kingdom. We're, we're not sure exactly about who you are. And so Jesus just says, well, then who do you say that I am? And only Peter, one of the few moments that he jumps up and gets the answer right, he says, well, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the one that we've been waiting for, the one that's going to give his life on our behalf. And Jesus affirms that moment in him. And he says, you, you don't know this just because of head knowledge or because of, you know, every time I pull a rabbit out of my hat or some of the cool things that have happened. You know that in your inmo, innermost parts. You know that because God has revealed that to you. And so he makes this statement. Jesus does this play on words where he says, you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, a little bit of church history, a little bit of church conversation here. Uh, we know that some variations of Christian faith take that phrase of Peter being the rock and being the one in which the church is built on as kind of being the father of the church. Now, as a church, we don't necessarily embrace that. Why? Because Jesus is told to be our foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone by which all of it's built on. But part of it plays out just in the language that's being played out here, okay? Okay. Now, one of the interesting pieces is that um, Peter's name comes from a variation of a word, Petros, okay? It kind of means little rock, okay? But the word that is being used here is Petra, which means big rock, like foundational rock. And so Jesus is using this play on words, but in the Aramaic, G Peter's name is also Cephas, which means stone. And so you you're hearing his name being said out loud. You're understanding a variation of how these guys see Peter as being the rock, being uh, a rock, a portion of this scenario. And Jesus is trying to say this. Jesus is trying to say this foundation, the statement that Jesus is the Messiah is a foundation by which all of our kingdom and all of our people and all of our followers, that is the statement by which we will declare and we will embrace. And Peter, you are a rock within the rock that helps lay this foundation. And this should be encouraging for all of us because that's really what our faith is, is that just like Peter, our identity is being a part of the rock or a small rock on a greater foundation of generation after generation that has made this declaration that the Messiah is here, it is the person Jesus, and it is Jesus by which he died, he buried, he rose again, and that's the foundation by which we all stand on. Amen. Does that make sense? Okay, so Jesus says that for a moment, and Peter begins to understand that, to be affirmed in that moment. And you think, wow, 
Jesus has really just given the big old thumbs up. He's just endorsed Peter as a great leader. We're about ready to step out. Let's see what happens. And then the disciples get together and they're celebrating Passover. Now, Passover is what we had discussed a little bit last week was that... Uh, Passover is the feast where they pause to celebrate how the angel of death, in Jewish tradition, uh, the angel of death passed over them as one of the plagues. And it passed over them because they had been instructed by Moses to take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost. And that would be the marking. The blood of the lamb over the doorpost would be the foretelling to the angel of death that they are God's people. And so they were protected. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, who's considered the Lamb of God. And his blood over the cross post or the, the cross beam is a reminder. It's a, it's a parallel of saying, now Jesus Christ is once and for all that payment. Passover meal, the last supper that Jesus is having with his disciples, he's pulling them all in, and he's about ready to do a hard reset on everything that they know and now how they're going to live differently. And while they talk about their tradition and the Passover of how God provided for them, Jesus says, okay, just catch this, just catch this. He grabs the bread like normal, and then he says, this is my body broken for you, and he tears it. He takes this cup of juice, and he says, this is my blood poured out for you. Now, in Passover tradition, there are multiple different layers with this, but that's, that's the poor man's version, if you will. Jesus takes that meal and takes the Old Testament history that they know about, puts it in real-time discussion and says, this is going to be my body that's broken. This is going to be my blood that's poured out. And I am making a new covenant. I'm making a new commitment that it's going to be my sacrifice, my death, my burial, my resurrection that is going to become the payment of sin for all of humanity. In that moment, a couple things are happening Judas, of course, is going to betray Jesus. It leads us towards this, this holy week that we're a part of. And Peter and Jesus get into a bit of a conversation. And Peter being overzealous, see, Jesus tries to wash their feet as, as, a, as a moment of hospitality and humility. And Peter's like, no, 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 don't wash my feet. And then Jesus says, well, I, I need to wash your feet or you can have nothing to do with me. And so Peter says something like, give me a whole bath, which is really awkward and it should be awkward. And Jesus kind of says, dude, just get yourself under control. He, he doesn't really say that. It's not in any translation except my brain, okay? Um, and then he says, you know, out of all this, Peter, you're going to end up denying me. Matter of fact, three times you're going to deny me. And even before the rooster crows a second time, you'll deny me that third time and it's going to happen. And Peter's like, me? What? No, we're bros, man. We go way back. I am so with you like nobody's with you. And sure enough, that's the passage we're going to look at now. Here's what it says in Mark chapter 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, this is after Jesus has been arrested and, and taken in. Peter's in the vicinity. Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out to the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. So after a little while, those standing near Pete to Peter said, surely, surely you are one of them, for you are Galilean. He began to call down curses. He swore at them. I don't know this man that you're talking about. Immediately. Isn't that, isn't that kind of eerie, right, at this point? After all we've learned and all we, immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And then Peter remembered that Jesus had spoken to him before the rooster crows twice. You will disown me three times. He broke down and wept. One of the gospel accounts says that Jesus and Peter basically saw each other in that moment. I think I'd cry too. Don't you? You got to wonder if maybe he just wanted to stay close enough to Jesus that he could see what was going to happen. Are they really going to kill Jesus? The description is that Peter is following at a distance, not so close, but not too far away. Not to be right up on it and in it, but not to be so far out of the way that you can't see and hear what's really happening to Jesus. I'll just be honest. When I hear stories about Peter... 
I don't mock him. I don't point a finger at him. I see me. I see me with my best intentions. I see me with my promises. I see me with my hopes and desires of the kind of person I really want to be. And I realize that I miss that mark so often. Do you feel that way? I mean, imagine to be sitting so close with Jesus, to be living in relationship with Jesus, to be watching and hearing his teaching and to being in that rhythm of, of what he's about and what he's doing. And there's some servant girl. I love that God uses somebody who, by and large, would be overlooked in this environment, right? Somebody in the backdrop, somebody that nobody else is paying attention to, she sees the moment for what it is. And so she leans into him. You got to wonder if maybe somehow she hoped that he would say, yes, I was with Jesus. And she could say, what are we going to do? What's going to happen next? You got to wonder if maybe she was looking for some comfort, some solace, some understanding. I don't see her necessarily being a, you're that guy, you're that guy, you're that guy. I think it's just the natural outflow of us a circumstance in a scenario where everybody's confused. People want to see Jesus. People want to know that this is the Messiah. And unfortunately what happens, Peter denies him. He breaks down and weeps. Jesus is right. And perhaps there's nothing, nothing more discouraging than doing the wrong you promised you would never do. Is there? You think about that in, as spouses, as parents, as friends. There's nothing more discouraging than doing the wrong you promised you would never do. But the truth of the matter is you cannot, you cannot own what you do not confess. Until you face it, it just stays out there. What's interesting is is the scenario that Peter is described in as he's first found warming himself. He's standing by this fire, this opportunity to, to, to get some comfort, to get some warmth. And maybe there's just enough light from the embers that people begin to see his face and recognize him. Maybe it's in the way he's having conversation. Maybe it's in his, his hands and his mannerisms. But all they know is that people begin to see, well, you look like somebody who's from his region. You sound like somebody who's from his region. People recognize you as being with him. Aren't you with him? No. No, I'm not. And I don't have a clue even who you're talking about or what you're talking about. I'm just trying to get warm. And the rooster crows. You imagine almost the shame and disappointment that comes into Peter's life at that moment. Jesus can't use me. Jesus won't use me. And frankly, I don't, I don't blame Jesus. Wouldn't you feel that way? I'm a mess. And all I ever do is screw things up. Can I give you some good news? Here's what I think Peter should have known in this moment. is that Jesus sees you, sees in you what no one else sees in you. Now that's empowering and it's intimidating, isn't it? Jesus sees you in your flaws, in your rebellion, in your sin. And he sees in you a future that even you don't even understand. And who you could be for the kingdom. And the influence that you might have on the people that you come in contact with on a regular basis. See, Jesus knows about you what no one else knows about you. Jesus has a very unique perspective. Jesus knows when you're walking around smiling and your marriage is up against the wall. Jesus knows when you're driving in a new vehicle or wearing new clothes and you're broke as a joke. Jesus knows when you're lying through your teeth trying to tell everybody, do I need to go further? You understand what I'm saying? When we put on the facade, when we push people aside, when we try and present ourselves as something that we're not to keep our own neck safe, Jesus still sees us. He sees through it all. He knows you like nobody else, but he sees in you what no one else sees. The truth of the matter is, it's because of that love that leads Peter to this next conversation. 
See, what happens in the next few moments is Jesus, of course, is crucified, buried, raises again, and he begins to appear to his disciples. But many of the disciples have scattered at this point. They've kind of gone back to what they did before. And so Peter's one of those guys, and we find him back out on a boat. Here's what it says in the Gospel of John about, Jesus, about Peter and Jesus, starting in chapter 21, verse 9. When they landed, they saw, a fire, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus says to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and he dragged his net ashore. It was full of fish, 153, but even with so many fish, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, hey, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him who are you? They knew it was the Lord. They came, they took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you, Jesus said. And feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, uh, do you love me? He answered, yes. Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. A third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. I get that. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, if I'm Peter, I've got a little bit of deja vu going on, right? Peter goes back to what he's comfortable doing, what he knew before Jesus. And he goes back to fishing. This is the place. This is the, this is the, the environment that he was a part of when Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He pulls his boat ashore. As he gets out and puts his feet on the ground, they... They smell this fire. They see someone doing breakfast, right? And you got to wonder because anybody that barbecues around here knows there's a different smell between wood flame and charcoal grills. You know what I'm saying? And this word for fire, both the one that Peter is being warmed by and the one that he's about to have breakfast is a charcoal fire. You got to wonder if he began to be reminded of his own failure. A moment of hospitality invites them to a, a, a makeshift table, so to speak, to have breakfast with a friend. And as they invite him there, he says, go bring some more. Bring your own fish. And so he gets his fish, and he's reminded of a time, oh, yeah, he was fishing. And somebody said, throw it on the other side. And he had a great catch. Deja vu is going off all over the place. The smell of fire, an overwhelming catch. And then they sit down for breakfast. Says he began to take the bread. Do you think maybe they flash back to that moment of, this is my body broken for you? Do you think they paused and remembered him? I mean, they didn't have to say anything. I don't know if it was his voice. I don't know if it was the way he tore his bread. I don't know if it was they saw the, the nail scars in his hands. But everyone knew we were about to sit down face to face with Jesus. And they have a meal. They have a meal. Hospitality tends to disarm us all, doesn't it? Relationships that are broken, conversations that need to happen. Oftentimes around a table of friendship, there begins to be this, this new fellowship that can happen. And while all the flags are going off, all the sirens and alarms are going crazy in front of Peter, Jesus is just saying, come, share, enjoy. Be with me. I don't know about you, but when I fail, when I make mistakes, what I want is distance. I don't want to face it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to have to address it. But when we encounter God's grace, God's grace makes our past and everything about us go into the rearview mirror. I love this quote. It says, grace is not spiritual amnesia, but it's a rear view mirror. It's a reminder that even while our sins seemed greater than what we thought we could overcome, Jesus 
has put it behind us. It reminds us, and we are invited to remind people that there is grace for all of us, that our sin has been overcome by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that none of us are worthy. But three times in this conversation, Jesus asks almost three times a question for three times a denial. Do you love me? I mean, do you love me more than what's in front of you? Do you love me more than what's around you? Do you even love me as a friend? Jesus is pressing into Peter, and you can imagine it hurts. It always hurts when we tear off the scab, doesn't it? It's only then that new health and new life can come. And Jesus is not trying to injure Peter. He's trying to heal Peter. And once again, Peter feels the pain of his own denial. But Jesus doesn't say, well, if you love me, then you've got to do this, this, this. He says, then join what we're about. Feed my sheep. Be a part of the mission I once called you to. Discipling, growing, helping other people grow and join a movement that's built on a foundation that I am the Messiah. A rearview mirror is a great picture of grace. It puts things behind us. It reminds us maybe of where we've been. It reminds us of what's been put behind us. But we must warn ourselves. You can't drive forward focusing on where you've been. The grace of Jesus shows where you've been, but it takes you where you're going. It continues to propel you forward. The failure doesn't have to define you. And God's grace begins to be the fuel by which you grow and become who he knows you can be, to be something that no one ever knew you could be. Three rooster crows, three pronouncements of love, and one invitation to change the world. So here's the question for each of us. What in the world is stopping us from making a difference in the world for Jesus? What is it that's become our charcoal fire? What is it that's become our denial? Is it the pursuit of ourself? Is it the, the rebellion of our heart? Is, the, is it the pursuit of a relationship or a, a drink? Or is it just the broken relationships? Is it the disappointment of our lives? What in the world's stopping us? Because God himself is inviting us to come face our moments of denial and find forgiveness and healing, and restoration. I mean, here's the real question that maybe we have to ask ourselves today. Will the gospel be advanced because of us or in spite of us? Are we going to allow our world to begin to press in on us and allow the shame and disappointment and discouragement to keep us at a distance from God? Or will we face our denial? Embrace God and allow our lives to be a testament of how God can use all people, how God desires to use us for his glory and his honor. Let's move to our time of response. I think oftentimes when we talk about moments like this with Peter and we think about ourselves, we have to address the two issues that don't often get brought up. We all admit we sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all admit that there are moments in our lives, in our relationships, that we're stubborn enough we pursue ourselves more than anything else. We don't surrender ourselves to God. And oftentimes, if we allow ourselves if we allow ourselves to stay in that denial, two things will surface in our conversation. One is we will begin to talk about the distance that we experience with God. And when we do that, we begin to think about how far we've pushed God away, right? That in our, our distance, we begin to describe very simply that we don't sense God in our lives anymore. We don't sense God moving in our life anymore. I think the second thing that we experience 
is we begin to describe the disappointment that we think God has in us, right? I've failed, I've sinned, so God is far from me because God is disappointed in me. Let me caution you, friends. I'm not sure that's from God. Because when I look at Scripture and I see those who have rebelled against God and come to a heart of repentance, Scripture reminds us that God's not far from us, that if we turn to Him, He's there. Distance between God and our faith is man made. We've pushed God away. We didn't like how we felt. We didn't like the conviction. We didn't want to face whatever it is, but we've made that distance. God's not far from you. And the disappointment we put on God is because how we see, how we react to other people when things don't work out the way we think they should. Right? See, disappointment says that there's a, an expectation that we thought should have been met and it didn't get met. So can I give you kind of a backwards encouragement? God knew we were going to fail. It did not surprise him. So the father's heart is not a heart of disappointment. It's a father's heart of anticipation who has already made a way for our sins to be forgiven and our lives to be restored. See, we create the distance because we don't want to face what we've denied. And we embrace disappointment because we'd rather face the shame that we impose on ourselves than admit that we need a Savior. So what if, what if we quit stiff-arming God and we put our arms down? What if we quit hiding under this shell of disappointment and, oh, God's so upset with me, and realize that one of the best pictures of God is God in flesh who has already died, already been buried, already rose again, sitting next to a fire saying, come get warm and be fed. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you're so deep in your rebellion that you, you'd just rather not be here. I don't know if you're in a scenario with your friends or family that you've just become so calloused you can't even face an honest conversation. I'm not sure if you sit in your room at night and you drink yourself away because you don't want to remember all the frustration you have about yourself. Friends, it doesn't have to be that way. And so may I encourage you, may I encourage you as a, a man who looks a lot like Peter, I overcompensate, I'm overzealous, I stick my foot in my mouth, I overreact, I get prideful, I do so many things that are not what God wants. And yet, God says, yep, so let's fix this. Because I already have. What would it look like for each and every one of us to begin to live with the confidence, not assuming that our failure doesn't have a consequence, not embracing the reality and need for repentance, not, not ignoring the reality that God is a holy God and desires to have us called out to live differently. But to know that God's not the principal with the paddle, just waiting for one of his students to make a mistake. No, God's the one who's already paid the price. And so he says, come. God, I would pray that you today would begin to tear down our facade, our calloused heart and our critical mind, our sharp tongue, our haughty eyes. 
God, would you begin to awaken us to an invitation of a foundation that's been laid well before us, generations before us, the statement that you alone are the Messiah, the one who gave your life on our behalf. We find new life. We find forgiveness of sins only in you. And so, God, in our inadequacies and in our failures, God, thank you for not ignoring us or throwing us away, but inviting us, inviting us to a table of friendship, of food, satisfaction, belonging. God, may we eat at your table. May we experience the closeness and intimacy that you desire us to have. May we find satisfaction in you and you alone. And may it show up in our relationships, where we work, where we live, and where we play. God, we love you. It's in your son's precious name that we pray. You know, friends, in just a moment, we're going to respond. And if you've never been a part of this experience here at the church, I want to encourage you because in a few moments, as the music begins to play, several are going to come and they're going to pray maybe about what we just talked about. Maybe there's something that they've got to put down today. Maybe there's a distance that they've got to walk back to God or they need to throw off some shame. There's an open invitation for all of us to come to a meal today. It's bread and it's juice. It's a reminder that Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And there are six tables. We encourage you to go to the closest one next to you to eat the bread and drink the juice, to declare in that moment, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you believe in his sacrifice, that when you eat that bread and drink the juice, you are, you are declaring that it is his sacrifice and his alone. And then several of us will give We'll give of ourselves first and foremost through a connect card that says, I need prayer about this. I want to talk to somebody about baptism. I, I need to walk through this in my life. And others of us will give of our resources, our tithes and offerings. Not because God needs it, because he doesn't, but he deserves it. That all that we have and all that we are is his anyway. And when we give back to God, we are declaring that our life, even our resources, are his. So as we begin to hear the music, as we begin to sing, may you respond to God in this moment. Let's stand.